morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to the NASA Alumni League first Thursday program. Today is July 6th. I hope y'all had a really wonderful 4th of July celebration. I'm Lisa Spence and I'm your host for this afternoon. Our speaker today is Mr. Rob Kelso. And I'm sure many of you know Rob. He's been around for a couple of years and he has given presentations to us before. So just a little bit about Rob. Rob was born on the island. He's a BOI, born on the island of Galveston, and he grew up in Lamarck. He started his NASA career as a co-op during college and then hired on in the engineering directorate and the space simulation vacuum chambers. Say that 10 times real fast. Rob was recruited from engineering into FOD in 1979 as FOD was ramping up flight controllers for the first shuttle flight. Two years later, he was a flight controller at STS-1 in the staff support room and was moved into the front room beginning on STS-2. Rob led the first classified DOD flight on STS-51C in January 1985. Rob was selected to the flight director class of 1988 following the Challenger accident. With the call sign Falcon Flight, he directed 25 shuttle missions, seven as lead flight director. His focus was on Department of Defense missions on shuttle and flying the Air Force inertial upper stage for both NASA and the Air Force. He later served as the deputy director for safety and mission assurance prior to retiring in 2012. Among his many awards, Rob received the NASA Exceptional Leadership Award and the NASA Distinguished Service Medal. Following retirement, Rob spent four years in Hawaii as Executive Director of Hawaii's Planetary Robotics Test Site on the volcano of Big Island. Really rough assignment. He also spent two years of consulting to several South Korea space agencies and has spent the last four years as program manager of robotic lunar landers under NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLPS, contract. Rob holds a bachelor's degree in physics from Austin College and a master's degree in public management from U of H CL. And I'm pretty sure that we met mm -hmm. during some of those classes at U of H CL. So at this point, I am going to uh, turn it over to Rob to give his presentation. It's great to see you, everybody. And uh, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to come to now and um, make this presentation. Well, I'm a little taller than Lisa. <laughs> but it seems like my voice is carrying pretty good. Is it? Can you hear me? All right. All right. So uh, I think this is an absolutely uh, fascinating uh, subject, and I, I hope it's not only informative, but also entertaining to you. And, um, and I think it comes at a really good bookend of uh, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo flights. In December, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of uh, Apollo 17. So I want to share with you about how this interesting topic even got started out of NASA headquarters, what precipitated it, and some of the challenges associated with it, and, and some of the issues in dealing with how to preserve and protect the, uh, the Apollo sites. Um, and so uh, by way of introduction, um, even before <clears throat> this study kicked off, in 2007, the Google company uh, created a, a new X Prize. In this case, uh, the Google Lunar X Prize. And it was a $30 million prize, $20 million for the first commercial group to land on the moon. Uh, and as a part of the requirements, um, it was $20 million first prize, $5 million second prize. Um, and you could receive no government support. And, and Google's intent was to create a new ECAC industry uh, in the commercial sector for lunar transportation. And in fact, a number of the teams that started in 2007 are still in existence today and part of the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. But it created an interest out of 28 teams, um, uh, internationally, actually. And uh, the interesting thing out of this was that in addition to the first, second prize, Google set up what was called the admitted prize. And that was an additional cash prize 
to any group that went to a heritage or historic site on the moon, uh, like an impact site from a third state of Saturn or a survey site. So the, the teams were interested in some guidance, even if there were any legal issues the agency saw to commercial teams going to these Apollo sites. So the funny thing about this was out of these meetings, NASA headquarters uh, was like a deer in a headlight uh, to th all these companies. They had no, absolutely no guidance uh, in this area of the response to the, the Google Lunar X prizes. And that's all the direction I got. Nothing about who needs to be on the team, nothing about a charter, nothing about objectives. And so I ended up having to create all that myself. Um, so there were several perspectives to deal with um, uh, out of this. Uh, and, the, and the real focus was how do we not only protect these sites, but also how do we assess and evaluate these sites after 40 or 40, 45 or 50 years. So each of these sites, these lunar heritage sites, had a historic value and interest. It also had scientific value and interest the site after all these many years. So I, I had to create this um, interdisciplinary team. And of course, I started with some spacecraft, in, in, uh, spacecraft engineers and uh, well-known lunar scientists around the country. But I knew there was a number of skills to do this task that were not really resident um, in the form I needed within the agency. So I needed to bring on um, museum people, curators. So I brought on some people out of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Uh, you may remember Roger Lanius, a former historian here at NASA, uh, out of headquarters. He later went over to the Smithsonian. He and some of his people joined this interdisciplinary team. But I also recognized I needed uh, archeologists. Uh, this, is, this is history, this is heritage, these are existing sites. And they're experts in how you assess and enter sites without damaging the sites, but allowing you to evaluate the sites. So we brought in a number of archeologists, including some space archeologists. So it turned out that over in New Mexico, there were some uh, space archeologists that were already looking at how you preserve and protect um, uh, historic space sites uh, in the United States. Uh, in that case, it was the uh, V2 launch sites over at the White Sands Proving Ground uh, that they launched from, the, the Germans launched from in the late 40s and early 50s. And this group had got over to how they preserved those, those launch pads and sites that were used by the V2 and the, and the V2 at the WAC Corporal over there. So this constituted then this lunar heritage team uh, for us to uh, think about how we were going to deal with this issue. Then I had to decide what we were going to look at. So the goal was really to assess the historic value and how we preserve and protect the historic value of these landing sites um, with objectives in a threefold uh, perspective. One is to assess the risk. What is the risk of going back to these sites? So we minimize the damage to these sites and yet allow for access and assessment of these sites. And then secondly, to determine and assess the engineering and science value of these sites after 50 years of sitting on the moon. But the most important part of that was this pre preservation and protection piece, looking at touchdown targeting, exclusion zones, contamination. So a lot of flight dynamics went into that, a lot of robotics and mobility discussions went into that. Uh, so that we could characterize risk and how we can safely evaluate these sites for the agency and the public without destroying these very important sites. And so obviously, uh, and if, if you just wait, I, I think I'll answer most of the questions. We'll pick those up at the end. So obviously Apollo 11 was a pivotal historical event in, in all of mankind. And uh, it had a cultural component, a historical component, not maybe unlike the Alamo, but also a, a huge technical uh, component to it as well within the context of the Cold War. So it had this very compelling, even to this day, cultural landscape associated with these sites where humans visited for the first time. And those marks, those, that presence of humans are still on the surface there today. 
and we want to assess those. So we got into a lot of discussions and hours of how do we treat these Apollo sites? Do we treat them all the same, Apollo 11 through 17? Do some carry different significance to others? Do we want to open up all the sites to investigation? Do we want to close all the sites? Um, do we want to protect until we assess and then we care less about the sites? And we spent a lot of time uh, talking about that issue. One of the, the balance points, uh, assessment benchmarking points we had was looking at underwater wrecks. Um, underwater wrecks, as you probably know, have a, a large uh, disparate range of protection. So you have the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor, very significant historically, very significant culturally, uh, but also very important um, uh, in, in the United States. And, and in fact, only a few certified archeological Navy divers are ever allowed to go onto that site at Pearl Harbor. And they do so very, not very often, only to assess the, the state of the wreckage and also to quantify the oil leakage out of that. But it is highly, highly protected. Uh, the Titanic that just got a lot of news recently is very similar. There's historic and cultural aspects to it. There's scientific interest uh, in the Titanic, and it, it too has a lot of protection with it. But then you have places like in the Pacific Ocean in the Truck Islands, uh, where from 1945 to 1944 to 1945, uh, there were 70 shipwrecks in that uh, island and lagoon area and 400 air, aircraft that were um, attacked and sunk that are sitting on the ocean bottom. And in the Truck Islands, it's an open dive site for all recreational divers. No protection at all. So there's this wide range. And how do we, how do we think about the Apollo sites into that context, um, both from a cultural and archeological standpoint? So it was a risk versus gain uh, uh, type of discussion. It's the risk of going there with the chance of damaging these very historic sites but the gain being that we get after 40 to 50 years, an opportunity to evaluate what's going on to these sites. We still really don't know, even to this day. Uh, the footprints, what, we had a big discussion on footprints, obviously, and the footprint, right? What do we do with the footprint, even though that the footprint probably doesn't even exist anymore. Neil and Buzz probably trampled over it, getting into and out of the, the limb at, at the base of the ladder. Um, but we came to a conclusion that we can't protect all footprints. And it doesn't make sense to protect footprints and rover tracks, all of them. So we had to apply some sensibility to that. We also recognize that a number of the lunar artifacts are still in quote unquote operation today. They are still providing us data today. The lunar ranging retro reflector that was left there at a number of sites are still being used uh, for laser ranging out of Apache Point. Uh, to gauge that distance between Earth and Moon. And then uh, specific areas of interest, uh, astrobiology, historical, cultural interest, lunar processes, including geological and weathering environment, and sites as witness plates. You think of ELDEF, the Long Duration Exposure Facility. That's what's going on on the Moon now. These, this equipment that's still there is a Long Duration Exposure uh, Facility of of uh, how the environment on the moon and in concert with the sun affects it over time. And so what is there? Well, obviously the descent module uh, that was the launch platform for the ascent stage is there. Uh, but you know, we, we had an interesting discussion. We don't know really the state after 40 or 50 years of the Mylar blankets on the descent stage. And in my mind, and you know, as we go through this, you're gonna get all these pictorial uh, images in your mind of what's going on there. And that's the way we did and, and the public does as well. So we had this image that they're very frail, very fragile perhaps at this point after 50 years of in the lunar environment and the radiation and micrometeorite imp impacts. And I, I, I was remembering as a boy uh, burning a newspaper. And even after burning the newspaper, the, the, the newspaper still held together. It was black, it really wasn't readable, but it stayed together as one page until you touched it. You remember that? And when you touched it, it crumbled, it just turned to dust. 
And is that the state of the blankets at this point after 40 or 50 years? We just really don't know. So also the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package, ALSEP, is there. Um, this is the uh, uh, one of the ALSEP packages uh, for 16 or 17. There's the central station, and then there's the RTG, right? The radioisotope thermoelectric generator, um, hard to say. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking, is that green light still on? Is it still producing power after 50 years of sitting on the surface? Obviously, it's got a long half-life, but is it still producing power on the moon? And, and so all these things were going through our head. Um, there was a huge interest in the public after this study uh, came out on the American flag, uh, especially on the 4th of July, the news stations, NBC, CNBS, we're running specials about the American flag on the moon and what is the state. And even to this day, we really don't know the state of the American flag. Are they still standing? Are they even there? And, and some, some speculate, some scientists speculate that it has totally bleached out. It's lost all the colors of the red, white, and blue, but perhaps the fabric's still there. But maybe the fabric is totally gone as well and it's the pole. We're not sure if some are still standing. We think a few may still be standing from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, but, but we're really not sure. And the public was so captivated by what is the state today after 50 years of the American flag. And then the Lunar Rover vehicle, it's a plethora of engineering um, uh, interest from optics to uh, radiators, to the piano wire wheels, to combined composite structure. Uh, so great interest in that. And then the high gain antennas, the big fold out umbrellas we used on 12 and 14. And then the smaller high gain antennas that were on the LRV uh, and the J missions, 15, 16 and 17. And then of course, there's the footprints that had interest. Um, but even more than that were other areas. So you may you remember this from Apollo 15. This was the experiment Dave Scott did for Galileo to decide if uh, two objects of different masses dropped simultaneously will hit in a vacuum at the same time. So he had a hammer, his geology hammer, and he had a feather, which was a falcon feather because all three were Air Force. They'd gone to the academy and, they, and the lunar module was the falcon. So he dropped the Falcon and the hammer at the same time. Sure enough, they hit on the ground at the same time. But in our minds, like you, we're sitting there thinking, is that Falcon feather still there? It's biological material. Could it still be there after 40 or 50 years of sitting on the harsh environment and the radiation environment on the moon? And so other areas we uh, decided were of great interest in these sites. So dust transport, this is still a controversial subject even today. Uh, many people think that they're uh, at the Terminator crossing where the sun, um, the uh, electrons of the sun uh, impact into the micron sized particles of the regolith that they're actually levitated uh, in, into uh, above the moon. And in fact, remember on Apollo 17, the crew drew, made these sketch drawings in their checklist of what they thought were uh, levitated dust uh, around the lunar horizons. So uh, micrometeorite bombardment. And in our mind, we started thinking, you know, all these radiators were pure. They were clean. They were unaffected when we landed there. So if we go back and take pictures of these radiator panels, like on the LRV or on some of the experiments, uh, and we take a picture of that, we can do crater counting of micrometeorite impact and get a sense of micrometeorite flux over 40 to 50 years. So it gives us a historical record of what's been going on in the environment of the moon since that. And then the sandblasting effect. Uh, what is the effect of that in descent and, and also in the ascent uh, off the lunar surface? Uh, also space weathering. So we recognize that, again, a lot of this hardware is long duration exposure facility equipment. It gives us an indication of what equipment will deal with over many years and decades of operating in harsh environments like on moon and Mars. And so in a real sense, they're scientific and engineering witness plates. And then there's the survival of microbes. You know, a lot of the food trays and other things were dumped out of the, the cabin prior to 
ascent, and they're still on the lunar surface. And then interest in seismology, environmental baselining, the laser retro reflector. And I got to tell you a quick little story. Uh, after the press conference for the results, um, we got a, a lot of press uh, requests from media in uh, England. So it turns out that a, a very popular show in England had this, uh, um, let me say, poop guy. I think his name was Mr. Poopy. And uh, when they, when they, in English humor, right? And when they found out there's poop on the moon, and here's this spin in this radiation environment, and obviously there's a lot of bacteria associated with that. Their minds were just going crazy. You know, they're thinking the Godzilla thing and all kinds of things growing out of the poop and other biological stuff. And I, I went and found out there's 96 bags of poop that are on the lunar surface, 96 bags. So 96 of these critters may be rolling around, but, but that's what the interest was out of the press on that. It was, it was really historical. They, they wanted to focus not on the survivability of the Apollo hardware, but what was going on with the poop. Um, so we looked at the damages, uh, damage mechanisms that could really severely impact or degrade or, or destroy these lunar heritage sites. And, and obviously one was rocket thrust and sand blasting effect uh, in descent and ascent as, as well as flyovers. For robotics, uh, kicking up lunar dust with the wheels. And remember John Young on Apollo 16 with the LRV and he did the uh, running around as fast as he could and he was throwing all kind of dust on, on the moon. And then 17, Gene, Cernan had broken the fender on the LRB, remember that? And they tried to put, Larry, they put your maps over the fender to try to contain the dust, but they were always being showered with dust as they rode along. And so we were worry, uh, worrying about the casting of dust uh, landing on these historical sites. Biological contamination and e descent, descent, um, entry, descent, and landing errors. Uh, where there'd be failures during descent and landing that uh, may cause hardware spacecraft to come in unintentionally and, and damage through impact uh, these sites. Um, so one of the greatest risks that was surprising out of this was the interaction between the uh, rocket engines and the, the fine grains of the lunar regolith, the micron-sized particles. Remember, um, you know, it's talcum powder-sized particles but it's not soft talc. This is broken glass shards after millions of years of micrometeor bombardment. That's what the regolith is. And, um, and so anything that's sandblasted up through the engines is really sharp shards, uh, uh, shards of glass going in all directions that could be extremely damaging. This is uh, actually an asset picture uh, from one of the land launches. Um, but we did a lot of analysis and study over this for, for many, many hours. And again, the primary concern was damage caused by the ejecta uh, impingement from the arrow lifting of the, the micron-sized regolith by the engines, uh, and that the lander descent engines create this high-velocity uh, horizontal flow across the surface. And so what uh, down at Kennedy Space Center at the Swamp Works, uh, and then later at University of Central Florida with um, uh, Phil, Dr. Phil Metzger, he was using the Ames. Ooh, this is getting hot. This was um, uh, Phil and the group at Kennedy was using the supercomputer out at Ames. Uh, Pete Warden let him use it to do all the high, really high computational uh, fluid, uh, computational fluid dynamic flows of the interaction of the engines with the dust. And what they found is fascinating. I'll show you a blow up of this in just a second, but I'm a step away. So what the model showed, it was confirmed by imagery from the flights, is that the engines interact with the dust to create a, a, an intense intensified sheet of regular uh, micron sized particles that travel one to three degrees off the horizontal. So on Earth, uh, we have clouds that are uh, produced, of course, uh, on rocket launches. That's because of our 760 tor atmosphere, right? The 14.7 uh, atmosphere pushing back against 
the exhaust of the engines, but you don't have that in the high vacuum on the moon. So it actually creates this aerolifted lifted high density sheet of, in, of, of particles. And what, the, uh, what we found out through the measurements was that in Apollo, we excavated, we scoured uh, in lunar descent on the six landings, two, two metric tons of this stuff per landing, two metric tons. But not only that, and by the way, this was confirmed by the DAC imagery, the, the uh, data acquisition camera in the window of the limb. Because um, in, in that imagery, you can see during touchdown and landing, as the engine begins to interface with the regolith, uh, that there are rocks and boulders that are sticking out of this flat sheet. So you can see the top part of the rock, but through the half of the rock and below that, it's all obscured. You can't see really the surface very well and nor the bottom of the rock. So we knew that that flat rock, that flat sheet is reality. And Buzz, talking to him, uh, he said that at shutdown of the engines, that the sheet actually had a tail to it. There was def a definable edge to the end of the sheet. And that edge and that sheet of material went out and over the horizon. So the analysis showed that not only did we excavate two metric tons, but the velocities of the engines interfacing with the dust is at 2000 meters per second. So the other day I went and looked up what a sand blaster creates in terms of exit velocities of beating particles or sand. And it's about 500 miles an hour or about 200 meters per second. So folks, we're talking an order of magnitude more in velocity. We're talking another zero, not 200, but 2000. And it's an, an intense, dense sheet of these glass particles. By the way, moon's escape velocity is about 2.4 kilometers per second. So it's very close to escape velocity. In fact, the model shows that maybe some of the submicron sized particles actually can escape the moon. But clearly the model showed that this dust sheet goes out like a donut or a toroid out and around the moon and impacts uh, somewhere back uh, uh, 180 degrees bef before that. Uh, the other important thing to note was the horizon on the moon is about two kilometers away. Um, and that's very important to our analysis. We also looked at multi-stage engines, multi-engine configurations. Maybe that's me, I don't know. Um, so it's like a, a jet boat out on Clear Lake that creates these rooster tails. So in multi-engine configurations, unlike the limb, uh, you can get the interfacing of these uh, plume streams that create these big rooster tails that are even an exaggerated effect uh, to that. So here's that dust sheet of this mega sand blaster, again, showing it in more detail. And that yellow line is this very dense, sheet of material traveling at 2,000 meters a second. So here's Starship, right? <laughs> of course, the air is pushing back against that. But you see all of this debris flying around um, during the recent Starship launch and the damage that that debris did from, from the engines interfacing and destroying the pad and the surrounding structure, the roads, uh, was uh, enormous. So think, folks, think about Anything that's in line of sight to a dust sheet of these glass shards traveling at 2,000 meters per second. Solar panels, comm antennas, uh, lunar rover vehicles, habitats, right? Uh, cars, uh, dog houses, whatever. That stuff could just be obliterated by this, this uh, order of magnitude sand blast. So, um, this was very interesting. This just came out from the Chinese a couple of days ago in June. Uh, they did an analysis of the Shanga 5 lander that uh, landed and then it had an ascent vehicle, much like the Russian Luna vehicle from the late and mid uh, 70s. It landed on the moon and the ascent vehicle took off and they did analysis of the damage from the ascent stage and found uh, very surprisingly to everybody that the, uh, the damage to the surface was twice as large from the ascent stage as it was from the descent stage. 
And no one had predicted that. So think about that when we're talking these encampments on moon and or Mars or these big starships. Uh, to me, this is really, really scary. So um, the, we have actually some historical and scientific data associated with that from Apollo 12. So remember, uh, Al Bean and, um, and Conrad went down the Surveyor Crater and they took the, the scoop or the claw off Surveyor 3. Again, engineers wanted to see what were the surface effects of being in the lunar environment and the radiation in the sun after 31 months of exposure. So they took that claw and then they also took the camera housing and the camera shroud and brought it back to, to Earth uh, in order to study the effects. And, and they saw and we saw uh, that there was severe damage to the thermal paint on Surveyor, the white paint uh, through the radiation and it had darkened to a brown over time. Um, but the important thing to remember, uh, think of that dust sheet, right? One to three degrees off the horizontal. The thing that made Surveyor different on Apollo 12 is that um, Apollo 12 landed up on the rim of Apollo 12, of Surveyor Crater. Surveyor it was actually uh, 16 feet or more below the, the planar level of the limb. And it was uh, 155 meters away down in the crater, but it was below the surface. So the Surveyor never took the full brunt of the line of sight impact of this dust sheet from the limb. So what happened to the uh, Apollo 12 uh, uh, hardware that we brought back? This is an image of that. This is part of that shroud. So I'm gonna step over here because this is really interesting. So you see some various changes of shading. You see kind of a dark area here and a light area here, and then some things going on up in here as well. So this, this was uh, essentially what Surveyor looked like, the paint, after 31 months. It was a, a brownish material, a darkening from the radiation. But there was this whiting area over here, and that's where it got sandwiched. And to the point that the paint had gone into failure. There were rosebuds uh, created there, which means that there are all these uh, failure cracks in the paint caused by the sandblasting effect. But then we get into this area, which is absolutely fascinating. So this is a blow up of that. So here's this brown material of the paint that is what Surveyor looked like. And then you have this white ring. So this white ring is the virgin thermal paint. It was under a washer uh, on Surveyor. So when they took the washer off, you got a, a, a benchmark of what that paint looked like that was uh, protected from the sandblast. And then you see what looks like a shadow here, but it's really not a shadow. It's, it's an artifact of the bolt head being here of uh, protecting this area of the camera shroud from the, sun, from the sand blast. So the sand blast was coming this direction. It hit the bolt head, which protected it and left what looks like a shadow mark. And then it obscured and, and blew off a lot of the uh, upper levels of the paint from the from the sand blast, but this was a sand blast. So that's the, the artifact that you see out of that. But we blasted the hell out of that thing. How did we do that when the dust sheet was one to three degrees of, uh, off the horizon and sailed over Surveyor? So the analysis showed that there was a severe particle to particle interaction within that dust sheet. And the sand blasting effect was caused by secondary plume effects of from particle-particle interactions to the point that we blasted the hell out of Surveyor. But it would have been so much worse or destructive if it had, if it had taken the full line of sight blast of this dust sheet created by the descent engines. So the conclusions was that we, we did a lot of damage. We removed a, a bunch of the paint out of that to the point where we ended up with a failure in the paint of pits and cracks. But the scouring, again, of the Surveyor would have been much worse if it had been line of sight uh, to the dust sheet. And then uh, the lunar material that adhered to Surveyor was there present prior to the limb touching down. So we took all that and then uh, began to think about recommendations. And we decided that um, up to that point, NASA headquarters was right. There were no US government uh, guidelines or requirements for preserving and protecting these sites from future visiting vehicles. And that was our job to go do that. 
And we set out to do technical recommendations. We decided not to do requirements because that would have brought in a requirement um, compliance component. So these were best practices or guidelines or recommendations that we passed in to the whole community. Um, but it was interesting. We decided that, you know, the U.S. government still owns this stuff. There's still a government issue stamp, right, that we're all familiar with sitting on a lot of that hardware. And if anybody damages that hardware, they could legally be held liable for damage to that equipment, even though it ain't coming back on the moon. So we looked at three different areas that were possible to assess or people could go to. Uh, one would be the impact sites, like the Ranger spacecraft or the S-4B third stage of the Saturn. Um, there was also the unmanned landing sites, like the Luna series or the Surveyor series. And then, the, of course, there's the six Apollo sites. But if we think about those, how do we classify those 11 to 14 to 16? How, do we make them all the same? Do we make them different? What was our thought on that? So our task was to figure out how to preserve and protect, but also to assess. That was the catch-22. How do you not to destroy in the, in the artifact of going to the site that which, which you want to investigate? So it was very interesting. And then we, uh, we decided to focus only on uh, US sites. I don't think I touched anything. Yeah, I didn't, I don't think I touched anything. So uh, we decided to focus only on US sites. We gave Russia uh, these recommendations so that they could consider that for their own hardware, but we didn't uh, discuss anything with that. So we came up with three boundary conditions. Uh, the first boundary condition was um, called the, um, uh, the um, visiting vehicle surface mobility boundary. That's how close something could come to an object without touching it, but to inspect it. How close could it get? So we put bubbles, uh, various bubbles or cones of silence around uh, the heart sites and the hardware and around every artifact, we put an umbrella or a bubble. And then that, depending on the size of the artifact, uh, we allowed them to get closer or further from that, size, from that artifact to assess, but never allowing it to have physical contact with the site. Then we had the artifact boundary and the artifact boundary was about 200 meters and would include everything that was uh, man-made that were uh, objects, hardware within that site. And then we had the vis vehicle, vehicle uh, visiting vehicle descent and landing boundary. And what we decided is because of this dust sheet, we never wanted a vehicle to have a line of sight plume effect that would absolutely destroy the Apollo sites. So we set up a requirement that any vis visiting vehicle would need to land over the horizon. That means that dust sheet would always sail over the top of the site and the site would never experience a line of sight effect by the landing. So they would have to land over the horizon. So we set up a two kilometer boundary uh, from which they would land. And for impact sites like Ranger and the Saturn, uh, we set a 500 meter landing boundary because it's below the surface. Um, so then we talked about descent and landing. For descent and landing, we would never allow a spacecraft to have a line of sight or trajectory that intersects the Apollo sites. So we set up a, a, um, a bubble around the site, uh, two kilometers, and their flight pass, their descent pass, had to be tangential to that two kilometer bubble. So th such that there would never ever be any overflight of that site. So they could land uh, outside of that, but always tangentially to the, to the, uh, the larger keep out bubble. And it had to include the uh, the dispersions for the descent, the three sigma dispersions within that keep out. So no overflight and touchdown targeting two kilometers from the center of the site. And that's what this is. The impact point should be targeted at a distance no less than two kilometers or three sigma of the landing uncertainty uh, to include the, the landing dispersion of, of lips out of that. And then uh, we talked about breaking stages. If you remember on Surveyor, uh, Surveyor never went into orbit. It was launched on a Centaur and was a direct point and shoot like a gun into the moon. So it, there was 
all the breaking had to be done because you're screaming into the surface. You're not going around the moon, you're going at the moon. So it had a large thicol star motor, solid rocket motor, that would take out most of the, the uh, descent velocity. And then they jettison, after that uh, solid rocket motor was spent, they would jettison that casing to lighten the weight. Then they had liquid apogee motors that did the fine guidance and the final touchdown out of that. So even in the surveyor case, they had braking stages that were ballistic objects coming into the lunar surface. So we recognize even some designs for uh, uh, lunar landers for the crew had talked about disposable braking stages. So we wanted to make sure that uh, a braking stage or disposable stage never came in the vicinity of the landing sites. Then we looked at mobility uh, from a historic perspective of the Apollo sites. And this is where we got into many, many hours of discussion of Apollo 11 to 12 to 14 to 17. And what we decided of that is to make special significance to the first and the last of the Apollo series, uh, to Apollo 11 and to Apollo 17. And keep those pristine, keep those virgin and, and, uh, and not open to uh, inspections. And anybody wants to look at it, they can do so, but they have to uh, stay within the uh, mobility boundary. Um, and so we came up with that, that it, they could inspect those sites, but again, they would have to stay out that keep out zone. So for Apollo 11, we set a 75 meter radius around the entire site from the lunar module. And for Apollo 17, which was much more expansive in, in traversing and activity, um, it was 200 meters. Now, this is a picture from LRO. You've probably seen this, uh, the descent stage from Apollo 11. You can see the three backside foot pads. The one in the front by the ladder is obscured, probably the pliss that they jettisoned um, after the EVA, along with the poop. Uh, it's probably including the, the uh, front foot pad. You can see where the TV camera is um, up here to the, the, uh, the north, uh, what is that, east. And then the laser retroreflector here and then over there, the large crater, that's the Little West crater that Neil went to. And you can actually see in the images, Larry was pointing this out to me earlier today, uh, the, the tracks where the, the boots had churned up the darker material of the regolith under the, under the soil. And so this is a, a picture of the, the crew tracks and then the, the toss zone where a lot of the material that was not gonna go back to earth uh, was thrown out of the limb like the plisses um, and uh, tools and equipment but prior to ascent. Uh, 14 is the TV camera and of course Little West Crater out over there. So here's a picture from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. The bar mark is 50 meters and this is a 75 meter radius that includes everything associated with Apollo 11. All footprints, all hardware, the descent stage, the camera, everything. So we said you can go up as close as the 75 meter uh, radius boundary, but you shall not cross that. That's the limit that you can go. You can go that far and take pictures, but we said for Apollo 11, you cannot go any further within that site. For Apollo 17, things were so much more distributed with the ALSEP gear and the LRV. Uh, so we set up a 225 radius meter um, exclusion zone around that, and that shows it to scale here. So you have the ALSEP equipment set far away from the limb up here, the descent stage, and then right here is the lunar rover vehicle that Ed Fendel gave us those great pictures on uh, during <laughs> ascent from Apollo 17. So we said, you cannot go in there either. We want to keep 11 and 17 pristine for all of that. Now, there are other rover tracks and, and footprints outside of that. We said, that's okay. You can go look at it. But nothing within that boundary. Now, for the other sites, we said, you can go and inspect, but you shall not touch any of the hardware. But you can get close to it. And that's what that says, is that rovers can go up to other sites uh, other than 11, 17, and enter all the way up to the artifact boundary, the little bubble around each piece of hardware, uh, depending on the size of that. But we also said, um, we want you to uh, not be in that area when you die. 
We're worried about um, failures of batteries and high energy explosions years later on the rover. And we didn't want high energy events to occur sometime in the future in these historic sites. So you had to die outside of, of the big boundary. Uh, we also said that when you get close to an artifact, your uh, velocity of the rover has to be such that you don't cast any dust. We didn't want any spraying of dust. Uh, or regolith onto the hardware. And backtracking, the way you go in is the way you got to leave to minimize any uh, damage and influence within the side from the rover. Uh, so we said the rovers are allowed to access all the artifacts from a 12, 14, 15, 16. Um, you can get as close as three meters to the descent stage and one meter around all the other individual hardware and no restrictions to any of the rover tracks or the footprints um, uh, within the region. Uh, then we also said that on the laser retro reflector, um, because that's still an active instrument that we're using, um, if you wanna go look at it, you can't get too close to it and, and your rover track can never be pointed at the, at the retro reflector. We were worried that a late command gets into a rover and runs into the laser retroreflector, moving it, and now we can't take laser damage anymore. So you can go tangential to it, up to uh, like a one meter radius away from the retroreflector. We're very interested to see if there's any elevated or lofted dust on the uh, mirror uh, mirrors of the retroreflector, um, but you have to do it in a certain way. And then we looked at contamination that uh, we didn't want any touching for contamination, one for contamination reasons. And on dust, um, you could do some low altitude flybys, um, but you had to stay at a certain altitude and again, tangential to the site. And um, uh, we had a burn angle constraints of the view of the engine to the site uh, because I was very concerned about any uh, unburned toxic propellant out of the engine landing on these historic sites and potentially doing further damage to it. So out of that, we added one more part, or I did. I called Ralph Rowe, who's up at Langley, and Ralph was running uh, the um, NASA Engineering Safety Center. That's where all these PhD in the, in the mm -hmm. agency live. PhDs in optics and thermal and structures, mechanisms. And so I gave Ralph all the hardware that's currently sitting there for Apollo 15, because we had a lot of stuff on 15, the first of the J missions, to include the, the LRV. On the LRV, there was actually a joining of dissimilar metals on the frame. So in my mind, this, this structure, this joining of dissimilar metals has gone through thousands of thermal cycles over 50 years, right? How has that joint held up on all this push-pull in the thermal cycles for all these years? Can you still read the dials on the LRV? What about the, the radiator panel that sits on top of the camera that Ed used to do all the filming? So they just were drooling at all the things they could learn about long duration exposure within optics and thermal dust effects, even the ascent effects from the ascent stage uh, when they left the moon. And we had categorized all the different materials that were left on the moon. And of course, the LRV was really a hot spot for engineering for a lot of different reasons. Um, but we also had a lot of interest in the science community for the impact sites. It turns out the craters created by the third stage and the, and the rangers have a morphology that is different, that is different than normal impactors, uh, asteroid impactors. And so obviously there's probably some debris in there, but the morphology, uh, morphology of the crater creation is, is somewhat uniquely different than other impactors. And that's confusing to the science community. So we said we have a lot of interest in that. Uh, we have interest in uh, high resolution images of these retro reflectors or radiators for micrometeorite flux. We're interested in data for dust levitation and uh, the geo properties of the regolith. And this one really got me excited as well. Remember, there's two golf balls on the moon from Alan Shepard. I think he took a, a seven iron um, and stuck it on one of his tools. And they, they never went very far. Uh, in fact, it's in this crater. 
uh, that there's the pole and then there's the little golf ball. And here's a blow up of it. And so in my mind, folks, I'm going, is that golf ball still there? Does it still say Titleist on there? Or has it, has it just been dissolved over time for micrometeorites and radiation? My mind just went nuts of whether the golf ball is still sitting there on the moon or whether it's just disappeared over time because of the environmental uh, effects. So uh, the results of this and many more uh, within this report went to the administrator. It was adopted by the administrator. Then uh, US, the US Congress picked up on it <clears throat> and they approved the recommendations to protect these sites from a historical and heritage viewpoint in a house, house resolution. And then the White House adopted it as well. Uh, through OSTP, the Office of Science Technology Policy, um, a few years ago in March 2018. And to this day, these are still uh, the standard by which we plan to visit that, not only to the Apollo sites, I think, but also appropriately when we go to uh, back to and visit encampments on the moon and Mars. We need to think about and take a lot of these hazards and risk into effect. Folks, uh, thanks for letting me come and share with you. I hope it's uh, been enjoyable and informative to you. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, we, we addressed that with headquarters and legal and uh, we decided we'd only focus this on our hardware uh, so obviously, if the Chinese bump into that, um, and, you know, they're still liable to uh, the, the legal requirements we have in owning that hardware. Uh, but we left it to other nations, uh, ESA, Russia, Japan, that have uh, sites on the moon to come up with their own criteria, but they could use this as a benchmark. Great question. Repeat the questions. And oh, okay. The, the question was relative to this application to other international uh, uh, partners and communities that may have things on the moon? Did I get that right? Later. Or later. Yeah. So um, again, we, we think a lot of this recommendation for preserving and protecting the heritage sites also apply to these encampments for moon and Mars. Um, you know, I, I think I, I'm really worried about these dust sheets. And now we're seeing larger ascent engine effects than we, we ever thought. So any hardware that you put down could be really susceptible from uh, the risk of damage. I mean, we could obliterate a lot of this stuff if we're not careful. So as we build out these encampments on the moon, I think it's going to take a lot of thinking. That's why uh, one of the first things in my mind, we have to build landing pads to minimize, we excavated two metric tons of this stuff. So we need to build stabilized landing pads that do not create a lot of these dust sheet and berms, berms that go around the landing site to deflect a lot of this sheet. So there's a lot of civil engineering in my mind that needs to go on before we just say, we're gonna send a lot of hardware down to the moon and we're gonna send Starship every month to, to go uh, visit it uh, 100 meters from the, crew module, you know. Uh, yeah. And, right. So um, several years ago, um, up in Branson, Missouri, they were running ads about dishes and other artifacts recovered from the Titanic that were on display. Um, most of us are not going to be rich enough to go to the moon to see these artifacts in person. Your curators from the museums, what was their interest in recovering artifacts, your scientists to bring them back to, to Earth to study or just? To, yeah, you know, that's a great question. Uh, it, it never got quite that far. Their interest is how do we, um, you know, there's world heritage sites all around the world that, that are protected, national or international sites. So a lot of these groups now are uh, uh, petitioning the United Nations and uh, copious uh, to try to develop a set of standards for preserving and protecting these sites, much like we do with national parks. There was some effort in talking to the, the park service about uh, making national parks of this stuff, but it's, it's not here, right? It's on the moon. And a lot of that uh, uh, legal 
capability did not translate. So there's a lot of work, not so much in bringing the stuff back and putting it in museums, but how to further the protection of these, uh, these really vital and heritage sites. Yes, sir. Well, I'm interested in how you got to the third dimension. I mean, you addressed it a little bit, but one of the first things I think would happen is somebody wants to fly over, but the thrusting yeah. drone, and there's nothing there talking about. Right. So on the on those flyovers, the drone flyers flyovers, our guideline was you had to say outside the bubble, you had to say tangential to that. Uh, and it's still a side look. But we wanted to be careful that we didn't have any uh, engine um, uh, by propellants that were unburned that go onto that site. So we did look at that. So for surveying, the answer is zero. You cannot get over something. Not a direct flyover, right? Because what if the engine dies, right? And now you're all going to ride down into the descent stage of the thing and go, oops. Um, you would have something that shuts its engines off and do a ballistic flyover. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Yeah, Rob, all we do is study it. We've got that as a standard, a public standard. Yes. Is there a document? Yeah, so it's a NASA document now, um, you know, as I said, with Congress and White House approval. And so it's a published NASA document that's releasable. The funny thing is that we also briefed this to all 28 Google teams, and they they hardly endorsed it. None of them said this was an issue or problem for them. Um, and some of, some of those are still in existence today. But I, I think it's just a matter of time before somebody goes back to the site. There's huge public interest in going and seeing what these sites look like after 50 years. I can see Discovery Channel, Nat Geo, you know, wanting to do a huge documentary of this. The public is just hungry for it. Some of that satisfied with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which helped to uh, demystify the people that said we never went to the moon, all right? But we, we still really don't know the condition and state of this stuff until we get next to it and down on the surface. Yes, sir. Uh, how much of the moon is recovered by these historical uh, uh, Yeah. So the question is, how much of the moon is going to be covered by all these sites when everything's given, said and done? Um, you know, we, we did address that a little bit because the first commercial lander, you know, that folks, there's still other than China, other than China, no one has been on the surface of the moon since 1976 when the Russians landed in um, on the on the east side of the moon. Uh, nobody has landed on the moon since 1976, except for the Russians. So the first commercial lander, whether that's intuitive machines or astrobotics or other, they're going to become a historical site by the nature. They're the first non-government space agency to land, right? So we, we were talking to them. Have you thought about that? You know, you're going to have uh, become your own historical site out of that. Um, I think the bigger issue that's ongoing with the legal community is relative to resource extraction uh, on the moon, the water and the mineral rights of the, of, of the moon. That's tending to take more of the, the legal discussions than it is relative to the heritage sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, obviously there are plans to build uh, short-term encampments and long-term encampments on the moon, right? Uh, the agency's perspective has always been to uh, test out and develop that capability when you're three days away from Earth uh, as a, a bridge onto Mars. So obviously there's a, there are plans, although NASA, I'm not sure if NASA has them or not, they haven't published them, but for these long-term uh, duration outpost facilities. 
Uh, let me let me take one in the back here first. Question: Following up on the international aspects, how much has been taken forward to the rest of the international community to directly um, capture what you've done in the recommendations and have them respect those recommendations? Yeah, I mean these are these are the NASA policy guidelines for visiting vehicles. Um, again, these are recommendations. To the vis, but it, but if you damage the stuff, you're going to be liable. Um, so we the intent has been again to provide these to the international community of what we have developed, and they can develop their own. But we we the intent of headquarters is that they would honor and fall in line with these uh, recommendations in preserving the sites. Follow up though, has there been any efforts to work with the Russian? No. No, other than to provide them a copy, uh, mm -hmm. there's not been any forward work on that, to my knowledge. Rob, we have a couple of questions oh. from, uh, from online. So the first one is, does anyone have a theory about why they see more damage on asset versus decent? No, I, uh, that, that, that analysis just came out in June, and it was surprising to everybody that, that the damage from ascent was twice that of descent. It, and, and thrust. it could be longer thrust. It could be the elevation. Of course, you know, you, I showed you that first picture uh, of the ascent stage taking off in the moon where you're just blowing mylar and all kinds of things out there. But um, no one's really, I think, had enough time yet to think about what that effect is. With ascent, more stuff there to be damaged. Yeah. Stokes? So, Ron, let's say uh, the Smithsonian or the president wants to get, say, some poop or something from Apollo 11. Who has the authority to override this document? Well, I'm, I'm sure that the administrator or certainly the president has the right to do this. This was, this was the, uh, to answer that question, how do we not damage something that is so culturally and historic significant in all mankind? Right, and that's why we put special significance to Apollo 11. But if someone really wanted to go and check Neil's footprint or, or the Pliss or the TV camera, I'm, I'm sure they could overrule those, uh, those uh, requirements. Right, so I'm, I'm glad we go back to the moon for the polar landing, the polar side. Yeah, that's right. So we yeah. get away from all this. Well, I mean, you're gonna pass over in a polar orbit, you're still gonna pass over them, just not from an equatorial plane, right? But the, you're still, as you go around the Earth, you're still going to, your flight path is still going to go even in a polar orbit around these, these sites. Yeah. So, Rob, have you uh, looked at the uh, Moon to Mars architecture definition document with respect to anything leading to a requirement for landing pads? No. Pads? No, we, we haven't. And, you know, Constellation was beginning to look at some of that. Uh, I don't know today, really, because I've left the agency. I don't know where that all stands. But but obviously, a lot of this is appropriate to um, to that construction. I, I tell you, I given a lot of thought if, you know, when I came to NASA, like you, Everybody was an uh, electrical engineer, an aerospace engineer, a mechanical engineer, or a physics guy, or a math mathematics person over at MPAD. But I think what we need in the agency that we don't have today, but the skill set we need in the future is in civil engineering. What are the building codes for structures in 1-6 gravity? How are we going to make these uh, dog houses? How are we going to make these landing pads? How are we going to make burns? berms? How are we going to move regolith material with bulldozers? Um, I think if, if, I were, if I were king of the day for Johnson, I would make in-situ in resource utilization a key skill of Johnson Space Center, and it's always been on a back burner. But we really don't know how to do the construction on the moon. We don't know how to drill. We've never made a brick. Can you imagine the first Acme brick made on the moon? Talk about historic, right? You want to bring that back to the Smithsonian. So uh, that's my thought on that. So, so my read of the architecture definition document, which I just reviewed because it was out for public review, ADD. that they've defined the objectives, which are the end goal objectives, mm -hmm. and they are now 
what they're calling decomposing those objectives to needs and characteristics. And I did not see anything that was a need or characteristic that would lead to a landing pad. Yeah. I may have missed it, but I sure didn't see it. So in, they, in my, in my side, you, inputs, yeah. Inputs, so. so even in Hawaii, my, my thought was always when you develop an encampment, the first thing you're going to do is build out the infrastructure, the roads and the landing pads and the berms before you even send people there. You're going to do that robotically. So I, I've always thought that you would prepare the site uh, with infrastructure before the crew gets there. And then they would come in stages. But certainly you need that capability if you're going to do repeatable launch and landing into an area. You've got to have a landing pad to stabilize the surface to avoid this devastating uh, mega blaster. Uh, the young man in the back. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, you know, when you're So Denny's point is the analogy to Antarctica and the various international countries that have their own site um, and, and uh, operate out of that site on, on, uh, in Antarctica and how that might play out in the South Pole. You know, if China gets into Shackleton, are they going to say Shackleton is now, you know, th these resources belong to us. You can't own any part of the moon. But you, you know, the big debate is over the resources. And you can't own Antarctica either. So Antarctica has been kind of a, um, and that whole treaty has been a very um, useful tool in thinking about these type of questions for the moon. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to, uh, when you mentioned earlier about the civil engineering and there is such public interest, um, but the NASA Alumni League also gives grants to students. And we recently met a student who wants to be a space architect. Uh -huh. So there are those degree plans available now. Yes. And seeing that there is an interest in this. Yeah. So just let you know. Well, that's a great comment. That uh, the NASA Alumni League supports the uh, Lunar Architect. It's a competition, isn't it? Uh, for students. Um, yeah, that's a great comment. Any other comments, questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm back to the Paul Levin. It was whisking dust at 33 meters at 10,000 pounds of thrust. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at, and of course, you know, you mentioned that, you know, this document came out in 2018. It was 2017 that Artemis was created. Yet now we're looking at landers that probably do have half. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, that velocity curve that you had, that yellow that went up, you know, there's going to be a lot of dust that's going to go through space. Yeah. Um, and we talked we talked about as an example of not putting the effort into landing pads. So that's, I'm Native American, so um, that's problematic to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I just thought I'd mention that. It's uh, interesting because. Uh, on one of the lander missions, um, 
we were trying to make sure that uh, I don't remember if it was, a, I guess it was one of the Chinese landers that, or maybe it was the Israel lander that failed, but um, to get the exact time of uh, the final descent landing so that we could give that to LRO and other lunar orbiting assets so we could see if there's any conjunction of that dust sheet, uh, depending on the altitude that it gets going around the moon, so that it wouldn't get sandblasted by this effect by uh, orbiting lunar spacecraft flying through that, that dust sheet. So we were even looking at doing conjunction analysis from a landing time uh, to orbiting spacecraft, just like we do with shuttle and orbital debris. Yeah. So an interesting discussion came up in uh, Dan Brasky's uh, commercial space lecture series a week or so ago. There was a company that was talking about uh, trying to do orbital debris cleanup and uh -huh. processing yep. and manufacturing. And they had suggested that maybe like the Vanguard spacecraft is still out there. Maybe it ought to be preserved as a historic yep. kind of site. Yep. And uh, some of the discussion led to, well, maybe there ought to be a historic uh, orbit for any satellites that uh, could be put instead of the disposal orbit, yeah, be placed in a historic orbit. Yeah, interesting comment. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah, maybe the ISS could go yeah. there instead of in the ocean. Yeah, so what's your thoughts on that? <laughs> could that could that become a historic? That's right. Instead of be disposed. I have one more because you didn't mention the prospector for some reason. I'm wondering why you didn't mention the idea of. Uh, lunar graves uh, again as a native American, I, I um, you know, the lunar prospect mission was yes. detrimental to the native the, the impact of human remains. Oh, uh huh. Yeah, I mean, we didn't, uh, that was outside the scope of our purview. This specifically was focused on. Uh, historical preservation and uh, assessing the risk of going there, but also gaining the scientific and engineering aspect of that. So that type of that uh, you bring up a great cultural question and point, but it was we didn't deal with it in our panel. But I, folks, I hope you found this interesting and thought provoking, and but also visually stimulating of whether the the golf ball is there, whether the feather is there. Um, to me, this is a fascinating subject, but it also translates into, you know, what we're gonna do with the outpost and these big, huge class landers like Starship and things. So thanks for letting me come. Thanks for the invitation. I hope you enjoyed the briefing today. Right. Huge thank you to Rob. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, he, he comes with so much energy that if your heart did, your, your heart rate didn't go up at some point in time during that presentation, mm, we need to go and uh, talk to your cardiologist a little bit there. So anyways, uh, that, that really does conclude our program for today. Um, you have about nine minutes until the keg of the month starts out at the blue, blue bonnet pavilion. So hopefully everybody will head on out there. I think the rain has stopped. It looks like the sun is coming out. Um, so thank you very much. And we will see you next month.